I'm Scott L. Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Latin America. Today I'm going to be addressing some of the feedback that I got about a couple of my videos, but they kind of all go together, about what to do when you need to bug out in case something terrible happens, you need that plan B. What are you actually going to do when things all fall apart? I want to give some practical examples because people have specific questions based on some what-if scenarios. And while those scenarios are unlikely, I think that not knowing what to do or how to approach it in those situations causes a lot more panic and having some concrete and answering direct questions that have been given to me of exactly what I would do or be prepared to do in those situations will help people understand why I say the things that I do and what my kind of preparation and planning would be. So we're gonna get to all that right after the bump. We're gonna to get to today's topic, but before we do, I have a quick question on the video that I think a lot of people have, and I can answer this one really quickly. So we're gonna start the day with Dave Wilson's question, which is, hello, Scott, you talked about the beach bus coming in from Leon. I literally got this as I was making the video. Where in Leon do, do you catch the bus? My wife and I are traveling to Nicaragua in a few months. I wanna see Las Benitas. So this is actually pretty easy to explain, but it's really hard to get to, which makes it not exactly the best bus scenario. This is one of my complaints about public transportation in Leon. It definitely works, it's just, for visitors, it could be a lot better. Anyway, so if you're coming into Leon, you're gonna come in obviously from Managua or from Chinadega, the only possible ways to come in. That means you're coming in on the east side of town, whether you're coming in by bus or taxi or whatever, that's where you're gonna come in and there's no airport, so you don't have to worry about that. So you're starting from the east side and if you're doing most touristy things, you're gonna be spending some time in El Centro, which leans towards the east part of the city as well. So you tend to have everything you're doing on the east but the beaches are on the west and the bus that goes to the beaches is on the west side of the city. So if you're looking at the city, it's roughly designed like a triangle. The Pan American Bypass runs north-south on the east side of the city. So you can see kind of the right edge of that triangle. And then the city kind of starts from the northeast and tapers down to a middle point in the west and then has a lot from the southeast and tapers up to a point going west. From the cathedral, which hopefully you can find on a map without me having to show you, there is a highway that goes directly west. That is the Ponaloya Road or Ruben Dario. That road is the only major road leaving the city and it goes directly west. That's the road you obviously have to take if you're gonna be heading out to the beaches, whether you're driving or you're looking to take the bus. So this isn't too hard to find. If you can get to the cathedral, head straight west. Once you're heading west and you start to leave town, the last barrio you're gonna go through is Sutiava. And as you go through Sutiava, the last major point in Sutiava is the Market Dito. This is the small market and it should be on your maps and everyone in the city can tell you where it is. This is not a unknown location and it sits right on Ruben Dario. You don't have to look around for it. You don't have to make any turns. You just go through the city and you're gonna to get to Marcadito. If you go past Marcadito, if for some reason you you actually drive through it and don't see it, you're gonna run into the Colegio Calasanz that is immediately after the Marcadito. Just turn around and head right back. As you're coming through Marcadito, which is just a little market that comes out onto the street, it makes traffic a major problem, right in front of the market on the north or right-hand side as you're heading west is the bus stop. This is where the bus pulls over and you can just catch it there and uh, goes right out to both Ponaloya and Las Bonitas. So, so really easy to do. It's just a pain getting out to Marcadito to take it. So that's all you have to do, but it is not something you're gonna find on a map. And if you're not a tourist or going to the beach very often, you may not be aware of where it is. So I wouldn't be surprised if some Leonese don't know how to tell you how to get there, but once you say you got to get to Marcadito, no problem. It is the only bus. It's a chicken bus, right? Old American school bus. It is the only chicken bus operating in Marcadito. Other buses don't go there. Some city buses will drop off there, but they don't have a stop. They'll just pull up and let some people off. But the chicken bus actually pulls up on the north side of the road and has kind of a spot to pull over. It's not, not much of one, uh, right as the road turns into a boulevard. In the market, it's just a road. Immediately after the market, like immediately, it turns into a boulevard with a centerpiece. That's where the, the bus pulls off on the north side. So just catch it there, and it'll take you right out to the beach. And of course, best places to get dropped off if you're heading out to Las Bonitas is look for the uh, Playa Roca El Simple stop. That's in the middle of the loop right on the bend. That's where you're gonna get the best center of everything there in Las Bonitas. 
Of course, when I started the video, there was no one in the hotel pool, and now there's lots of people, so I had to move into a room so that I could continue the video. All right, so the questions that I got, and I can't find them on my phone right now, and I'm in a hotel, I need to record relatively quickly, so I don't have a lot of time to go print them out like I normally do, but a couple different people brought up a couple different points, and I think it's worth addressing. So the first point comes from the video about setting goals. In fact, all of these do. So in the goal video, which is just like yesterday or the day before, there was this topic of this person who had said that, well, they want citizenship, they want residency, and they wouldn't give me goals. They just wanted these things. They didn't care what they did. And then, and then they said, well, when they started, they wanted them in Nicaragua, but then they said, would well, Costa Rica be better? Well, clearly something's wrong with the goals because the there's no implied goal in any of this. Residency and citizenship in Nicaragua and Costa Rica are very different animals, as every country is. So you can't ever say, well, I just want those things because they don't mean anything. They mean something in Nicaragua. They mean something in Costa Rica, but they don't mean something in a general sense. There's no such thing as residency with a set of what that means. Residency in Nicaragua means one thing. Residency in the United States means another. Residency in Namibia is another, right? Each of these is a unique animal. So you can't imply what it is you're looking for without being specific to a country. And so if you say, well, I want it in Nicaragua, oh, I don't like the method of getting it, so Costa Rica is better, clearly doesn't make any sense. There's no possibility of getting an implied goal out of that. We can't read it back, because clearly what they're looking for doesn't make any sense unless it's something we just don't know about. So the comments that I got on the video were, well, maybe this person is confusing residency with U.S. and Mexico because everyone just knows those and and they think everyone does what those places do. So we can excuse them for just wanting residency because they looked into these two places. So first of all, this person was coming from Asia. There's no reason to imply that they would know anything about the U.S. or Mexico. That would be an incredible leap to make as a starting point. And also, the U.S. and Mexico have incredibly different residency requirements, programs, and allowances. The U.S. residency would have the same problem that came up in the discussion, which was in Nicaragua, you can't get residency ahead of time as part of a plan B. So we're going to get to that in a little bit. But Mexico is different. Mexico is unique, not completely unique, but pretty unique in that their residency doesn't require you to be resident. It'll It's just something you apply for. You never have to go to Mexico to get residency. A little bit weird. Like, that's cool. Thanks, Mexico. But it's not usual, right? The United States does not allow for that. And if you leave the United States for an extended period of time during your residency, your residency ends, just like most countries. Mexico is unique in this that you don't actually have to be there and your residency doesn't expire. Mexico does this for very specific reasons. And Mexico is changing a lot of their policies. So whether this is going to last even throughout this year, we don't really know. So this is very important that these residency requirements and goals and are so wildly different. So he said, well, they must be thinking of this. Well, that's my point, really, because he's not setting goals. He's not identifying what it is he's looking for. He's randomly found the word apparently, right, according or the guess of the poster is that he randomly looked at Mexico, a random country on the other side of the globe that neither touches where he lives nor where he says he wants to be, and looked at their residency offerings that are very unique and said, oh, it's going to apply to everywhere. That's my goal. And even then, what was his goal in Mexico? To have some resident, even Mexican residency expires in time. It just doesn't expire because you travel. So it's all very difficult to establish what these goals are. But it's really important, all the things that I'm talking about in the previous video that that video referenced, which was my myths of residency and citizenship, keep playing out time and time again. We assume that residency or citizenship give us all these things. And I don't know where those beliefs come from. I understand. Maybe the U.S. does certain things. Maybe Mexico does certain other things. But we seem, when I talk to people, and why we, we mention these myths and why we say we got to have goals is because they're taking bits of what the U.S. does, bits of what Mexico does, bits of what they just imagined, combining them into some amazing package of, of miraculous services, and then, and then projecting that onto every country they talk to. Well, the U.S. gives you a path to citizenship. They do. Not a good one, but they do. Whereas Nicaragua and Costa Rica essentially don't. Yes, technically, but the U.S. actually has a path to citizenship. 
They want this because citizenship involves heavy taxation, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what you do. So the U.S. is pretty happy if you become a citizen and then never live in the U.S. They'll still tax you and they'll still make their money, money they wouldn't have had otherwise. So it works out for them. So they're very happy with that system. Nicaragua doesn't do that. So granting you citizenship and then having you not participate in the country doesn't do them a lot of good and it may actually be a negative. So they don't really look to do that. It's very different countries with different systems. And so it's really important that when you're talking Talking about these things, you can't take how one country does it and apply it to another. It just doesn't work that way. And similarly, the U.S., if you have citizenship, it's irrevocable. Even if you want to get rid of it, it's an incredibly difficult process and could be denied. You may not be given the option to give up your citizenship. In fact, there's many people who have citizenship who don't want it, never wanted it, didn't ask for it, and the U.S. just forces it on them and then uses their power abroad to tax those people who may have no connection to the U.S. whatsoever. But in Nicaragua, if you have citizenship, all you have to do is fly into the country and use a different passport than your Nicaraguan passport, which is something you get with citizenship, right? One of the reasons that people think that they want citizenship is because they get a passport from another country and that is mostly correct that you do get it but that it is useful or that they want it is often something they don't understand and want it for reasons so it's a separate set right well my goal is a passport well no again a passport is not a goal a passport is a tool like citizenship now the passport is closer to a goal probably you want citizenship in order to get the passport okay but the passport in order to get access to other countries and the Nicaraguan passport really doesn't do that uh, except for extremely rare circumstances. But if you fly into Nicaragua and say you're a dual uh, British and Nicaraguan citizen, you have citizenship, you've gone through the unbelievable, pro you know, unbelievable process of getting your citizenship in Nicaragua, you do that, you fly into Nicaragua, you present your British passport, you are instantly no longer a citizen of Nicaragua. If you don't present your Nicaraguan passport on arrival, your citizenship is instantly rescinded. You can work to get it back. It is not meant to be a punishment per se. It is meant to be a simple system of voluntarily giving up your citizenship. Very different than the United States, which has no such system. And so it's just different approaches. But these things highlight how incredibly different these things are. And you have to think of them as unique animals in every single case. If you don't, if you don't set goals and you don't avoid the myths, you're going to make decisions based on imagined functionality. So that's to answer that first one. Now, the second one, Javier uh, asked the question, and I think building on this is really good. Now, I couldn't find it again, so I can't read it, but he said, you know, you've lived in Nicaragua for years. You love living there. You've built a life there. Uh, presumably, a lot of people have been here much longer. Presumably. I know people, right? Loads of people have moved to Nicaragua and been here for decades. They don't want to be forced to leave. What if Nicaragua suddenly started kicking people out. You would want residency or citizenship to guarantee that. And lots of people say this. And again, I'm going to say, this is exactly why I have a video on the myths and the goals, because this is exactly the reaction that people have. And these are myths. So first of all, there's no precedent for countries basically anywhere in the world simply kicking out all the foreigners. If they're going to do that normally, it is during an incredible level of war. And I am not aware of any war in the Western Hemisphere that has ever happened where this has a precedent as a reaction to happen. There's very few places in the world where you can no longer stay or enter even during a war. Yemen, Syria, even Israel still allows people, visitors even, to come into the country just as a tourist, let alone people who want to stay, want to make a life, want to invest, anything like that. Generally, a war-torn country is desperate for investors, is desperate for tourism. They don't expect it, but they would like it if it was to happen. So the idea that Nicaragua would ever have a scenario where this would happen is really stretching things. It's not impossible, but it's important to understand this is why we made the what if video, right? This is a what if scenario. There's no statistics to say this will happen 0.1% of the time or one time every 100 years. There's nothing like that. In the history of Nicaragua, this has never happened. As to the best of my knowledge, in the history of Latin America, this has never happened. And on the history of the world, I'm not exactly sure when it's ever happened. I'm sure it has somewhere sometime, but in the last two millennia, has it happened one or two times and where and why? And what is the scenario? And why would you want to be there in a situation where that was to happen right now? Maybe you do. You've built a life there and you're willing to go through whatever. But we're talking about a situation so extreme that it's beyond anything we've ever experienced in humanity. So think about that. We're talking about a scenario where we must be pushed past the point of 
any knowledge, nothing we know about the human behavior and nationalities and things like that, none of them apply in a scenario where this would be expected to happen. All right, so this is where what if becomes super dangerous. And this is a perfect example of why we don't use what if scenarios in risk assessments, because they lead us to have an emotional reaction to something that we should never consider or never consider seriously. But we are gonna consider it, say, because Javier asked the question, what would you do? What would you and your family do if this was to happen? And that's fine. Like, okay, let's answer this. But remember, this is a statistic impossibility. So we don't have to worry about it. No one, no one has to worry about this scenario in these places, right? Maybe you live someplace where you do have to consider it for where you are, but you don't have to worry about it for here. And we're gonna explain why. First of all, statistically, never happens. So you can't put anything on it, and no human in human history has ever had value to having this uh, plan, right? So you're not going to be the first human out of 20, 30 billion humans who have ever lived to need this. You just aren't, right? 100% guarantee it, 120% guarantee it, right? <laughs> if you can go beyond 100%, right? That is, it, this is so not a thing. It can't possibly be explained how not a fear this is. But let's assume that the, the meteorite destroying humanity scenario is what we're talking about. So unlikely, then we run into the nothing you know matters, okay? So the people who wanna do this, and, and we talk about, well, that people wanna be able to bug out. They, people want a plan B, great have a plan B. What does a plan B mean? We have a whole video on plan Bs, right? So a plan B means you're prepared for something. It doesn't mean you take action. Once you take action, it's a plan A. Let's just be clear on that. So if your plan A, let's say you live, we're just going to pick some examples. You live in the United States. A lot of my audience does. And if you don't, if you're in Canada, UK, you can extrapolate, right? It doesn't matter. So you live in the United States and you say, okay, I'm really worried about the current whatever, weather, water, government, doesn't matter. You're worried about something that could happen in the United States. And the thing that you will want to do to deal with that is to escape the United States. Now, this is not a big what if scenario. This is a general risk assessment for people who live in countries because countries go through situations with some amount of regularity, not super often, not most generations, but within a reasonable amount of generations where a lot of people say, well, I'd really like to leave. Some really beautiful places have had this happen in the last, say, 300 years. Places you may not think about immediately, but once I say them are really obvious. Places like Ireland, when they went through the, the potato famine, right? Tons, most of the country left, right? It's a beautiful country, it's a safe country great place. It's hard to imagine today people wanting to flee Ireland, yet not that long ago, they needed to. Italy, same situation. When they went through unification and shortly the 50 years after, they went through a lot of hard times just figuring out who they were going to be as a country and a lot of poverty happened. Now, it wasn't people being slaughtered in the streets. It was extreme poverty. But today, it's hard to imagine Italy going through something like that, but they certainly could again probably not for hundreds of years, but it's within reason. And many Italians fled Italy to go to other places where they had better opportunity for themselves, their kids, whatever. And so these are things that we know could happen in countries that is unfathomable today to have that happen in the immediate future. So no matter where you live, it's possible that this could happen at some point, maybe not for you, but for your kids, whatever. So the idea that you may need to be prepared to leave where you are to go to a better scenario somewhere else it's completely normal. And one could argue that all of us who move abroad already are actioning that based on either our fears of what's going to happen or our opinions of the current scenario. So this isn't far-fetched. This is something that I myself have done, not because I was completely terrified of where I came from, but because I saw better opportunities for myself, my family, somewhere else. And so I picked a place and I actioned my plan A and I bugged out for real. And here I am living in paradise and things are great. So whether it's something you want to do now, plan A, or it's something you just want to be mentally prepared for so you can take care of it in the future, should something happen, plan B, that's a great thing to do. The place where we run into problems is people then say, well, I need to get residency and citizenship because it's going to make this plan B. Plan A, of course, you may need them right away because you're actually going to live there and maybe those places like Nicaragua will require you to have residency. So I get that. This is about plan B, the bug out option in the future. You are having a plan in case something goes wrong. Fantastic. So the problem with deciding that you need to have these things is, is a whole bunch of things. One, you're deciding on the country you're going to go to ahead of time. Now, when I lived in Texas, we did have a plan should there be a 
war. There has been times that I lived in the United States that war sounded like it may be pretty close. We always had a plan, didn't do anything to action it, but we were ready to jump in the car and run to Monterrey, Mexico. That was not because we carefully decided Mexico was the place to be. It's simply the border that was really close to us and we had to get there by car with our kids and our dogs. So that's a matter of physical logistics. So if that's something you have to consider, then great, you will know what country you may need to look at. But I don't need residency or citizenship in Mexico in order to action that plan. I just have to get to the border before the border closes. And if the border closes, whether from the US side or the Mexico side, my citizenship or residency aren't gonna matter diddly because the border is closed, I can't get through it. So that's, that's the first thing. These things don't matter in those scenarios. And when we're talking about something where you just need to buy a personal, right? Ah, oh, I don't like, I don't like how the weather has changed. I don't like all the hippies who have moved into my neighborhood. I don't, whatever, name the thing. It's your personal preference. When you decide it's time for you to get out, none of these things matter, right? Because you can just, we know the rules in all these countries. You have 100 plus countries you can just go to at a moment's notice and make your decisions from there. So that's not a problem. The time that it becomes a real problem, the thing that people are talking about in this needing residency and citizenship ahead of time scenario is where the entire framework of nationalities is falling apart in the country you're coming from or it's at wide scale war and so many people are moving that countries are going to close their borders, shut down tourism and not let new people in. And the presumption is that residency and citizenship will get you allowed in when other people are not. I think this is the big mistake. Those things apply today under the current scenario. This is where what ifs get really dangerous is because in a scenario where that would happen, all the rules that are in place today are gone instantly. If they're gonna close their border, then or if they're gonna start restricting tourism, then already the rules have changed. The rules have to change for this scenario to come up. So the idea that your residency is still going to work when the rules have changed doesn't make any sense. It could work, but so could tourism, right? Right now today, if you say based on the rules that exist today, you have the right to go to, assuming you're coming from the United States in this particular example, you have the right to go to Mexico or Nicaragua. No questions asked. You have the ability to go there and then, yeah, maybe you can't stay indefinitely, but you have the right to go there and then figure it out. And there's a process for staying longer once you're there. So in both cases, there's rules. So you can just in an emergency get there and you're good. The only thing that would protect you long term is if the current rules continue to exist. But the what if is that the current rules do not. So residency and citizenship, as we mentioned with Nicaragua, can be fickle things. If you're not a natural citizen, if you weren't born in Nicaragua, if you're not in Nicaragua when the world falls apart and the border is closed, it may not even matter if you were born in Nicaragua, lived in Nicaragua your whole life, and were just traveling at that moment. If the border is completely closed and there's no way in, they may not let you back in. They probably will, but probably in a world-ending scenario is a pretty difficult thing to assess. What we do know is that where everything has changed, everything has changed. And so the idea of what would you do? You can't answer that. I can't answer that because every single factor is likely to be different everywhere in the world. What the weather's like, who's at war, which borders are open, how they take people, which countries they take people from. Everybody's situation is going to be very unique and you're going to have to assess that on the ground at the time. Period. No exceptions. No exceptions. Zero. You can't plan for a scenario where there's nothing to build that plan upon. You don't know what anything's going to be like. You don't know, you just don't know. And so you have to be loose. So that what if is completely worthless. You can't plan for it. It's not that it's impossible to happen. It's improbable to happen, but it's not impossible to happen, but it is impossible to plan for it. There's too many variables and those variables are wild. It's not like, oh, they may let in 100,000 people or 200,000 people. It's they may close the border or just open the border. The country may collapse and they may not have any border control. It may be a wild wasteland where people are just running through the jungle. We don't know. It's a what if where everything has fallen apart. But let's look at a scenario just short of that. I had to do a little change of venue to finish the video. Okay, so the rest of the question was, what would I do personally? Or what would my family do if we were forced into the situation where we were no longer allowed to stay in Nicaragua? Now, this does not necessarily require some big, unbelievable, tragic thing. It's just some decision is made that we're no longer allowed to stay. And this could go a couple different ways. It could be that we're not allowed to get residency. And so we have to do kind of a tourist thing where we're out part of the time and in part of the time. I don't know anyone that this has happened to, but it's a theoretical 
theoretical possibility and not one that's so outrageous that we maybe shouldn't consider it, so that's fine. Or there's the other possibility that we simply aren't allowed to return to the country. We have to go and we're no longer welcome. That's actually more likely because it, it simply makes more sense. You can understand a scenario where you commit a crime or do something terrible and you're simply persona non grata and you're no longer allowed to stay. This can happen anywhere, anytime. Obviously, it doesn't happen very often to anyone anywhere, but it can happen. So it's, it's a reasonable question to ask, even though it's extremely unlikely. And of course, you should be asking this question anywhere. What if you were suddenly no longer allowed to live in your own home country or any country anywhere in the world you might visit? Where you are isn't really a major factor. This can happen to anybody, anytime, anywhere. Some places are less likely. And of course, if you live in your home country where you were born, you're a natural citizen, that gives you, in most cases, the most protection. But even that is not a guarantee anywhere. Even in the United States, where they are super, super strong about uh, maintaining uh, citizenship and your ability to live in the country, even if that's within a prison, they still have circumstances where you will get shipped out of the country. Very, very rare, much more rare than some places. And it's not really the worst punishment. In fact, for a lot of people, if you were facing prison or deportation, you would like deportation because it allows you to be free somewhere else rather than not free in the place that you want to be. Not everyone wants that. And of course, if your prison time is only a few weeks or a few months, you might easily opt to stay. But you have to be realistic that deportation is generally an option that is lesser than others. And if you've ever lived in places like the United States, you're familiar with how often deportation is said. It is a tactic used all the time. Now, people will say, well, yeah, but not for nationals. No, probably not, but that's not necessarily the case. And certainly nationals have been illegally questioned for their paperwork. Why are they asked for their paperwork? Because some government agency is considering the possibility of enforcing deportation on a citizen. Not that that really happens, but it's at least being considered and that's why people get upset about it, because you're supposed to not be able to be asked for your identification papers when you're simply doing normal things. Of course, if you're driving and you've done th like there's, there's situations where you can be asked for them. But in normal life, you are not allowed to be asked for your papers in the United States. But when you are, that means that the possibility of being deported even as a natural citizen is on the table. Right? What if they don't like the papers you have? What if they don't trust the papers you have? And I know people who've grown up in the United States fearing deportation because they just don't look like what the local police want the uh, neighborhood to look like. And deportation, if you can't produce reliable papers, if the government doesn't, all they have to do is say, we don't believe these papers and you can be shipped anywhere they decide to ship you to. So while we don't think it happens very often. We do know it's a real risk, even in the United States. That's not to say the U.S. is worse than anywhere else. It's probably the best for this. Like, I know nowhere who deports its own citizens less than the United States. Just saying that even in the United States, the possibility still exists. So it's something that has to be considered. So all that aside, the question was, what would we specifically do if we could no longer live in our chosen home of Nicaragua, no matter how unlikely that is? Well, so there's some practical approaches to this. Now we have some concerns and most of you know, but if you don't, I have two children, I have my wife, I have my business, I have my dogs. And so those things create some logistical challenges. I can't just hop on a plane and go absolutely anywhere. My citizenship is the United States, so I have a pretty good ability to move throughout both Latin America and Europe and most of Asia and most of Africa. So the opportunities are pretty endless. But we already have backup locations picked out not so much because we feel there's a need to have a backup location, but that's not a bad thing to have, but more because living in Nicaragua, there are things that we sometimes miss, and because of that, we have identi place, identified places that do offer things that we really want in places that we really like, and maybe we want to spend a bit of our time vacationing there or living back and forth between places, and a few of those places that are on our radar all the time. One is Guatemala. Guatemala has a really good option for us that we can jump in a car and drive there. So if we were in a situation where we had to panic, had no time to plan, had to simply throw everybody in a car and leave more or less immediately, driving over the border to Honduras would instantly give us the ability to be somewhere that we can stay indefinitely and be out of Nicaragua, meeting whatever, uh, you know, uh, contrived scenario we're trying to uh, establish here, that would suffice that we are no longer in Nicaragua. And then we can drive through Honduras. We could choose to stay in Honduras. That would be absolutely fine. It's not my first choice destination, but I do like Honduras a lot. If you told me today, well, you're not allowed to live in Nicaragua, obviously I'd be 
one, very sad that I'm not living in Nicaragua, and two, really hurt that someone wanted to deport me. But <laughs> once I'm past those things, just being in Honduras, if, if just magically, for some reason I had to live in Honduras, I wouldn't be incredibly sad. Honduras is a very nice place. I like it a lot. It has a lot to offer. It's very similar to Nicaragua in many ways. That would be fine. I could drive on for just two hours and be in El Salvador if that's where I wanted to go. And El Salvador also decently high on our radar. Beautiful country with a lot to offer, very safe, and certainly something we would consider. But my experiences in those countries say that I just tend to like Guatemala a little bit more, but the reason is pretty straightforward. Guatemala City is the largest urban area in the region with the most to offer. It's huge compared to any city in any of the other countries. In fact, all three of those countries have total national populations that are more comparable to the population of Guatemala City than they are to Guatemala as a whole. For me, I like that urban lifestyle and I specifically like Guatemala City a lot. It is one of my, if not my number one city in the world. Probably my number one city is Roma, but Guatemala City is up there with Rome and Madrid. So it's in that class of my favorite places as a city in the world. So if I had to jump in a car, take my kids and my dogs and my wife and drive to Guatemala City, I would only be annoyed by how many bathroom stops we have to take. I would not be incredibly sad that we ended up in Guatemala City. Plus the weather is a little bit more to my liking. It's one of those things where I like Nicaragua in general better, but I like Guatemala's weather better. And I do like the variety of food in Guatemala City. There's an awful lot of things that wouldn't be big negatives. And my kids, plan on probably living in Guatemala City when they are older and on their own, at least part time. So it would be close to even where they have said that they want to be in the future. So we have those plans in very, very simple terms. Here's things we can do just like that. Yes, we have plans. Would we be sad? Yes. Would it be tragic? No, it wouldn't. Not honestly. That's one of the reasons I like Nicaragua is that if I did have to not be in Nicaragua, the number of choices I have within easy reach are really simple. I can just get in the car and go to any number of places that I would be perfectly happy with. Of all the places within easy reach that I would be the least likely to go to is Costa Rica, which is super close, but it's not like I would be horribly upset living in Costa Rica. It's just, it's more expensive and a lot more touristy. Those are things I don't tend to look for. My family doesn't tend to look for but it's a nice, safe, beautiful country with a lot to offer as well. So that's not a problem. But where we've lived previously in Panama is only a few hours farther along. Okay, it's like 10 hours farther, but by car, that's only part of a day's drive. Like seriously, when you're moving countries, another 10 hours is not a huge deal. We loved Panama and having to move back to Panama would be kind of awesome. We'd love to be there as well. All of those places are just when we're talking within easy drive. If we decided that none of those locations or if all those locations decided that we weren't someone that they wanted either whatever caused us to not be able to live in nicaragua also caused us not to be able to live in any of those okay that would be now we're getting pretty pretty rough but if we started to have actual logistics we still have choices one of those is driving on to mexico mexico is a bit more expensive it's a bit more dangerous right now but it's still a huge beautiful country with so many options it's hard to imagine that we would ever need to go farther than Mexico. But let's just hypothesize that even Mexico is off of our options list. Well, no problem. We can still drive to Panama, grab the ferry. We don't have to take a flight and get to Colombia. Once we're in Colombia, we have the ability to drive to all of South America or take a bus or whatever. And really, we have endless options. And all of this is how we could move without having to get on an airplane. If we were in a position where we needed to get on a flight, we would probably need to charter one because of the dogs, but we can charter one to anywhere we need to go. Honestly, it's not one of the hardest things having to move out of a country. We un I understand why it feels like you invest in a, in a place and, and you become so a part of it that moving is really, really hard. But let's think about for a second. When we talk about like my family, we a number of years ago spent a lot of time moving from country to country because we were looking for the right place to be. And when we finally found the right place for us, which was Nicaragua, and I think for a lot of you maybe as well, but for some of you for sure it is not, but it's definitely a wonderful short list option to make sure it's one of the places that you're considering. But even though we did all that. At some point, we decided to move away from all the people that we knew and move from all the things we were comfortable with and move to a new country and make a new life there. Well, having to do that again, while a negative in some ways is 
a positive in others. It's something that we've done multiple times and every single person, literally every single one, who is considering a move to a new country in the first place is already going to have experience doing at least that one time. So what we're talking about is only having to make that decision one more time. Now I understand for some people that is a really big thing and the older you get, the harder it is to do that over and over again, but it's not that hard the first time. Moving to a place like Nicaragua or many others. If you're an American, you decide to move to Mexico. I talk to people all the time who are like, oh, I moved to this country. And then after 10 years, I moved to this country, right? They just get kind of tired of it. They want to go on and explore something new or something that they like changed and they, they're trying to find that again somewhere else, whatever. But people who are flexible enough to make that move are often flexible enough to move again. And while each time you get older, that makes it a little bit harder. Each time you become more experienced at it, that makes it that much easier. And let's like for real, if you said today your challenge, we're not gonna make it that I was kicked out of Nicaragua. We're gonna make it a challenge. Someone's offering me some huge amount of money if I move to another country and there's an amount of money that'll make me move to another country. Let's be honest, like it's just where you're gonna live, right? So someone offers me a hundred million dollars, but I have to move to pick your country of choice. We're going to say Paraguay and I have to move to Paraguay and I have to live there for two years and I have to do it all within the next 72 hours. I have 72 hours to figure out how to get my family out of Nicaragua. I don't have to get into Paraguay yet because I mean, it's pretty far, but I gotta be on my way. I gotta be making it happen and then I gotta live there for two years. Then I get a hundred million dollars, but until then I got nothing. Okay, would that be the biggest deal ever? I, I would hate giving up my home in Nicaragua. I would hate moving away from our friends. I would hate getting away from the, cu the culture that we love so much. But I would also be excited about the adventure of moving to a new country. I'd be excited about just all the new things, the, the all things to learn and things to explore and things to experience and new food to try. And just the process of moving to a new place is exciting and fun and, and valuable and good for you in many ways. And so yeah, there's things that I, there's a reason why I just don't do it every day, but there's also reasons why it sounds really cool to just move to a new place. And it's one of the reasons why I encourage people who've never moved to another country before, really stop and take a moment and consider why not just pack up and move to Nicaragua? You can always change your mind in the future. In fact, that's how simple dealing with getting kicked out of a country is, is that as long as the only thing that's happening is that you can't stay there anymore, the idea that you need to do that again somewhere else is one of the things I try to teach people. It's so potentially easy. And one of the reasons why you potentially don't want to buy a house somewhere is that that's one of the things that might make that hard. Well, okay, now I got to sell my house and go, or I got to go and sell my house, or I have a house I can't use, which is very unlikely. I don't know one who's ever had this happen to them, right? We're talking about scenarios that are theoretically possible for sure, but so rare that we can't really put our finger. That's not a hundred percent true. I do know someone who rented a house that had this happen to them. But I never knew someone who had actually bought one and had to deal with it that way. And it's, it really, life can be really flexible. And so I know that uh, a lot of people um, look for permanent plans. And I think this is a, a big mistake in life. I understand 100% why we want stability. I understand why we want permanence. I understand why we want to put down roots and never have to give them up. And that's, that's real, but humans do not have the power to control their environment in that deterministic kind of way. And trying to do so is dangerous because it makes you vulnerable. It makes you at risk. That's kind of the same thing. It makes life expensive. And it, it, that flexibility that you give up can be a really big problem because uh, just like in your career, people who uh, decide that they're, they're gonna make their entire career based around where they live and they don't have the flexibility to move, they just don't have those options, they generally fall behind in their career. And later in life, when they decide where they want to live, because they haven't gotten as far in their career often, they don't have the power to choose where they're gonna live. And people who were a little bit more flexible earlier built their career up more and have more power to determine where they're going to live later in life. I have a friend, he decided to take a path of being a nurse while I went into IT and he said, I don't want to be on call. I want, I want like this really set control of my hours and do all these things. And I just want to control because I don't want to be tied to my job. But by the time we were in our late thirties, he was completely tied to his job. He couldn't just take off work without risking his job anytime he wanted. He couldn't set his own hours. He couldn't, there's so many things he couldn't do. And I was able to do anything I wanted. I could go live anywhere I wanted in the world, travel anytime I wanted to. Uh, I made way more money than he did. All those things that he thought he was avoiding, he ended up creating for himself because he thought that by handing over this, this, 
handing over flexibility to get the things he thought he wanted, what he ended up doing was handing over the power to control himself as much as possible later in life. And I think with, with moving, the more that you, especially when people rush into, I'm gonna buy a house before I move. My gosh, you're giving up your power. You're giving up your flexibility. You're giving up your options for control later in life. And later in life could be weeks or months away, not 20 years, 30 years. It's immediate. What if you get somewhere and find out you don't like your neighbors or you discover a new place you want to go? You're locked in or at least kind of locked in both mentally and financially. You don't have the power to just go where it makes sense right away. That kind of stuff. You don't want to be locking yourself in until you've developed a level of confidence that you're really sure that you've made the right decision, that you're in a, in a non-precarious position, whatever. But the idea that you could get kicked out of a country, I think it's hard to get across just how much this isn't a realistic fear that you shouldn't plan on. Like it's just not, it doesn't matter how many what ifs we say, it isn't something you plan for because it isn't a realistic fear. But in this particular case where we're challenged to come up with it anyway, I think the first thing we discover is, oh, even though it's not a realistic fear from a it could happen perspective, it's also not a very realistic fear from a what would go wrong with my life perspective. It's just not that big of a deal. I know people who have been kicked out of countries and flourish in others when they get there. Did they like being kicked out? No. But you come to a country, you're not necessarily legal. Sometimes you take your chances and sometimes you end up having to go places you didn't mean to. It is not the worst possible thing. Not great, but not the worst. It sounds so much worse than it is. We've made it into such a terrible sounding thing in so many cases. But what's far more realistic is that you're going to be in a life situation, not where you get deported, not where you get banned from a country, but where you personally decide that that country, whatever country it is, isn't the right place for you. This could be for so many reasons, economics, family needs, uh, health concerns, uh, it, you know, your current financial situation, the weather, right? Who knows? All kinds of just, you just learned a new language and you want to go experiment and you learn German, you want to go live in Germany and try it out. All those things. It's really important to understand that you could need to move countries, but it's almost certainly 99.99999% of the time, literally, it is going to be because of you, not because of that country. And if that happens, you're going to discover it's not hard. It's not a big deal. It is not the big scary thing. Yes, the first time, whoa, there's so many things you don't know. There's so many things that you're just panicking about. I get it. I've moved for the first time, obviously, in the past, and it was kind of scary. But then we did it and said that really wasn't hard and it really isn't scary. And in fact, it was really fun and valuable and rewarding. Let's do that again. And we did again and again and again. And at some point, okay, it got to be a little bit too much and we, we put down some roots in Nicaragua. But at no point does the idea, and I think this is where people don't understand, when they say, what if you had to leave? So, <laughs> is, is that supposed to be something that worries me? Why would that worry me? I, it's unfortunate, but it's not scary and it's not tragic. It's really simple. And for all of you who have not yet moved to your first other country, this is the situation you're literally talking about. So when we're talking about it, we could call it self-deportation. I'm deporting myself from my original country and I'm gonna find another one to go to. So everyone who's in the US, Canada, UK, wherever you are, and you're thinking maybe Nicaragua is a place that you wanna go, you're talking about enacting this very scenario that we're talking about right now. What if you self-deported yourself from whatever your home country is and Nicaragua was the choice of the place you wanted to go? Well, how bad is that? It's awesome, right? None of you are living in a, uh, as far as I know, a completely scary scenario. It's simply that the balance of what you're looking for, how expensive it is, maybe how safe it is, maybe the food quality, maybe the weather, any number of things are tipping to where you're saying, oh, the place that I'm in now isn't quite meeting my needs and someplace, probably Nicaragua, because you're watching this channel, is the place that, that I wanna be and it, it serves my needs. Well, at some point I'm gonna self-deport myself over there. Now you have the option of coming back right? Presumably. And that's nicer than actually getting deported and not having the option of coming back. I totally understand. But we're only talking about having to do the thing that you are potentially opting to do. And hopefully in going through this process, watching my channel, doing your research, planning for this, you can say to yourself, oh, one of the things that Scott is constantly 
letting us know about is just how easy this is, how not scary it is, how in fact it should be fun for the most part. Like moving your luggage around, I get it's it's a lot of struggle, but the actual doing it, it's super fun and cool and rewarding. So yeah, what if? What if these things happen? Not gonna happen. But if it did happen, not gonna be a problem. I have so many options that are so nice. And that's just, we have Latin America, we could also go to Europe. Like if that's what I had to do, that's fine. Right, one way or another, being with your family, being with your dogs, being in a place that's fun and interesting that meets your needs, go research the world. The world is a big, fun, exciting place. There's lots of places like Nicaragua that are absolutely amazing and may fit your needs really, really well. And all you have to do is go explore them. Don't be afraid because fear is the thing that's gonna hurt you the most. The thing you should be, right? FDR, the thing we, biggest thing we have to fear is fear itself. And that's real. People hurt themselves from the fear of doing something that's better for them because they, they do these what ifs. But what if making my life better has some negative to it? Well, it probably is, but your life is better. See, that's what you're going for. <laughs> better is better. There is no worse and better. There's individual things that may be worse, but overall it's better. So go, don't be afraid to make things better because it's better. Thanks for joining me, like, and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller, as always, Share on social media, tell your friends about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow. And if you would take a moment, one of these four videos on the screen, just give it a click. That would help me out a lot.